Our final uh, session of the day, uh, we're delighted to have from California, or maybe from, she's calling in from Hawaii, uh, Jody Evans, one of the founders and leaders of, of Code Pink, uh, and who continues uh, to uh, lead the way for all of us. Jody. Thank you, Jonathan. Well, it's so lovely to spend the day with you passionate essential workers for peace. I'm inspired by your commitment, the campaigns, and your many years of work. And every day I'm grateful to the amazing community that is Mass Peace Action. It is also awesome to be together to celebrate the victory of those who have created the conditions that we can all say nuclear weapons are illegal. <laughs> They've always been immoral, but now they are illegal. That is firm ground to stand on. That is a shift in the narrative. And we need to feel that and be nourished by it before we turn to look at the stupidity of those in power, those driven by greed, who will ignore and deny this reality. But we can't let them. The ground we stand on is firmer and has been created by those outside the hegemony of the United States. We have those in the global south to thank, and I hope we remember to keep them in our hearts during our activism and engage as we engage here in the empire, as too many of them bear the brunt of the war economy daily. I come to you from the west coast of Turtle Island, the land of Tongva people. Over 18 years ago, I flew to DC to call Code Pink with Medea Benjamin to George Bush's color coded alerts frightening the US to war. I had a primal scream of no, I wanted to deliver outside the White House. Ended up staying for eight, six months and now over 18 years as war begets war, begets violence, begets more atrocities. When Bush was threatening war in Iraq, I worked in Watts teaching life skills to gang members who had been left behind by an extremely racist system in Los Angeles. It was a place where 20,000 people had been killed in an inner city war zone from 1980 to 2000. I was working with Akilah Shirelles who negotiated the peace treaty between the Crips and the Bloods before the Rodney King uprising. I learned from that work that the young men I was working with all had fathers who were soldiers in the failed war on Vietnam. That war had come home to our city and no one acknowledged it or talked about it. So I flew to DC to say no to another war on another group of innocent people. No to using lives of innocent people to kill innocent people, no to killing for greedy needs and no to using taxpayers money for another failed invasion of another country like Korea, like Vietnam, that most people seem to have forgotten the US had lost and where millions of innocent people had died. And there we were, all of us, 12 million of us globally saying no to war and it didn't matter against the most bald-faced outrageous lies. And we have watched the insanity of war, the volume of weapons and the amount spent on violence continue to escalate because war is an addiction, as David Swanson reminds us, that we have failed to take into detox. We just keep engaging with it like it will listen to reason, which I love that Erica Fine this morning talked about, you know, earlier about that. So a few years ago at Code Pink, we can, as we continued our endless efforts to end war, we truly understood, like I did in the neighborhoods of Watts, that to end, we were not going to be able to end war until we ended the war economy. The war economy, the extractive, destructive, oppressive economy that is killing you, our communities, and the planet. And that war economy is the tit too many suck at and think it is giving life instead of realizing the dystopian reality it is creating. Economy in Greek means the making of home. We can see the home of the war economy. It is rendered is sick. It is dying, it is starving, and it is torn to tatters, the very fabric of society. But there is also a peace economy. It is the giving, sharing, caring, thriving, relational, resilient economy without which none of us would be alive. And COVID really taught us, if we'd forgotten, that it is the essential workers who are part of the peace economy that are truly essential to life. It is the war economy that devalued, privatized, and squeezed the life out of them over the last 40, 50 years. So as a peacemaker, I ask myself daily, how am I creating conditions conducive for life? 
At every level, the war economy is destroying life and war serves it. We can't end war until we end the war economy. Jim was speaking to it just minutes ago. At Code Pink, we have 21 ways to help us divest ourselves from the war economy habits that we've been acculturated to, like frogs and boiling water. Things we as peacemakers aren't ourselves aware of, and you can find those lessons at Code Pink, um, uh, the peace economy. But today I wanna talk about a few of those habits um, that help the war economy thrive because it creates conditions for us to feel alienated and that we live in scarcity instead of abundance. The habit it creates in us is the habit of being transactional and not relational. The war economy has forced us to behave transactionally to survive. And we all need to break that pattern and become relational to build the movement we need. The culture of transaction creates the conditions that allow the warmongers to feed lies that arise fears that make people act against their own best interest and the best interest of others. We can all learn from Reverend Barber who took the time and attention with Moral Mondays to be relational, to build trust, to present contradictions to the lies they were living with and acting from and affect the culture of his state. It was from that that he and Reverend Liz Theo Harris have continued to cultivate the peace economy across the country with the Poor People's Campaign and National Call for a Moral Revival. We are here together working to end war because of our empathy, our love of others, our heartbreak at injustice and violence and our desire for a healthy future for the planet and her people. We need to stay tapped into that. That needs to be reflected in how we treat each other and where our work for peace is rooted. Let that always be our tuning fork that others can attune to because to grow first, we need to be coming from love. To exercise our relationality, we need to bring ourselves more closely related to our local communities. And I mean our local communities, those who are at the greatest effect of the war economy, those right now suffering the results of the war economy. At Code Pink, we are cultivating our peace, local peace economy as part of our work. If we truly know we can't end war until we end the war economy, then we must be cultivating what is missing. We must be cultivating the values of peace where we live. And it all begins with listening. It takes stepping back and listening. We tend to show up with all we know. The war economy itself is full of hubris and the fulfillment of their needs at the cost of everyone else's needs and lives. No one exists but the needs of the greedy war economy, no matter how rational and how true the facts we raise about its abuse and violence and how it comes home to militarize the streets of our cities, it has a pattern not to listen. So ours should be one of listening. To be effective in growing the movement and growing the power we need, we must listen to those at the effects of the war economy. I think Michelle really nailed that just a few minutes ago. Many of us in the peace, are in peace communities together. We are here today being nourished and inspired, educated to be more effective in our work. But how to expand ourselves to also engage with those who are at the greatest effect of the war economy, not as a transaction of how to use them for our needs but to truly show up for them with our love. Wars started happening in history when societies became more complex. So I say, let's start with the essentials, with the basics. What sustains life? Food, care, love. In my community, we discovered there were 3000 homeless youth. So I went with food on the weekends and over the months we listened to their needs and engaged the community in delivering them clothes, backpacks, condoms, healthcare, mental health counseling. All of it was rooted in love and understanding that the war economy thrives because they are homeless and that it too won't end until the war economy ends. This transformed our community. Food is now grown along sidewalks, the homeless youth have been employed. The model of loving them has become a formative light in the entire city of Los Angeles. In a world where not in our backyard is a solution to the unhoused, the best piece of land near the beach has been allocated for the housing of the unhoused. It was a short process. We call it planting seeds of peace. 
you can do that locally and find um, out how at Could Pink in our um, One Billion Rising Gardens. Because we need to be nourishing each other instead of the malnourishment of the war economy. That will change hearts and minds. So we have three areas we have to be constantly addressing. Culture, corporations, Congress. Congress responds to culture and the will of the people when and only when they are not totally bought off by corporations. Yes, we want to be putting our attention to Congress, but we are small and how some of that attention has to go is our engagement in other movements and seeing how we can serve them and help them grow in the understanding of how war serves the war economy that is the bane of their existence. Culture, that means taking on the lies we swim in, like war doesn't like keep anyone safe or secure. It steals from the future and from the planet and it rips the fabric of society. Where are the movements working on the health of community? Who is working to end private prisons and militarization of our police? Join Black Lives Matter to defund the police and abolish prisons to get to the goal of defunding the Pentagon. It is now fully obvious that white supremacy, which is the roots of the war economy, has fully infiltrated both the military and local policing. It is clear who their allegiances are to, not to safety and security and the needs of the people, but white supremacy, which is what the US is as it invades and bombs people of color across the world for its needs. How can members of Congress now agree to fund that after feeling that reality? Don't worry, they'll come up with excuses. Or another lie that the money spent and the lack of transparency is all for national interests in the care of US citizens? No, it has always been to take care of those in power and the 1% and the corporations. Find the movements taking on corporate greed and violence and make this also our work. Many of them are the environmental movements as the war economy is destroying the planet and they are taking them on. Um, Join with them in taking on those investing in fossil fuels or join with the indigenous communities like Winona Leduc who and others working to stop line three in Minnesota. Top down is the war economy. We must come from the place of listening, developing relationships of trust and understanding which takes time. We need to take the time and come back with information that relates to what is real in their lives and build trust that they too have a strong ground to stand on that is rooted in peace. As an activist, I've always understood that activism is affecting the person closest to you. Why? Because we change our minds with information from someone we trust. Then we must take on the media that is the oil on the fire of war, spreading it wildly, which means we must cultivate authentic culture and take ourselves off the diet of the Hollywood kitsch. I want to note that it was Bernie in his jacket and adorable mittens that became the meme from the inaugural because he was authentic in stark relief to the manufactured show. People are hungry for authentic experience. That authentic experience is happening in our communities. That is the power to expose the lies. We will find inspiration being together and inspiring each other, telling our stories. This means more finding more time to engage with cultures that are rich and, vibrant and old and wise. Corporations, the ruling class, the 1%, the elite, however you name it, the ones who think they benefit from the war economy and their short-sighted greed, they are also driving forces and power behind the war hegemony of our minds. They benefit from all of it. Fascism arises from it. The Molotov cocktail made of the ruling class and the war economy is patterned to drive the system to fascism. Without regulations and accountability to hold back the addiction to war and greed, it will destroy all of us, them included. But as with all addicts, they are blind to their own destruction. We take them on with our divest from the war mission campaign and BlackRock, the poster child of the war economy. The years of taking on Larry Fink has made him too toxic to fulfill his dream of being in the Biden administration, but it is in 
infiltrated with his staff. The revolving door of corporate power and political power is not a revolving door. It's a full on passageway with no dividers. They are one. And nothing drives right wing extremism quite like government corruption and secrecy. So don't let Congress push more laws to control terrorism. They need to change their behavior instead. So Congress, they are affected by the ruling class of which they are members and the media. We have to encircle those in power and squeeze them back. Send them retreating as we expose their dirty laundry and lies and violence at the core of their votes and action. Trust in all three areas, the media, corporation and Congress are at an all time low. So why do they have the power? And how do we take that power and build the power? Here is our opportunity. We have the greatest capacity right now. We have them on their heels. We have to remember that Biden didn't win the election. He was the lesser of two evils and it was him or a dystopian future. That bar is too low. It is up to us to raise it. People want the bar raised. They don't want to be in the gutter behind barbed wire. We have to believe in each other, create trust and connections across movements, divest ourselves from the systems of oppression and be engaged and in action. Every day, we must be the building blocks of trust and the truth we can stand on. The breathtaking Amanda Gorman said in her, the hill we climb at the inauguration, we lay down our arms so we can reach our arms to each other. Let us embrace her words and free our arms for hugging those in our communities at the greatest effect of the war economy. Let us remember racism is a result of the war economy, not just poverty and the militarism in our streets. Arms should never be funded as they are intended to kill the child of another mother. And let us not allow the story out of the Biden administration that we must prepare for war with Russia and China because for preparing for war itself is the path to war. We instead need to model reaching our arms to each other in cooperation and peace. The problems of our world need peace. They need the peace economy, culture and habits. We cannot be sidetracked by their lies. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. That was an incredible 